Have you ever found yourself doing something you really didn't want to be doing and wonder why you're doing it? For Steve, a 55-year-old executive in a high-powered job, this was a daily, if not hourly, question. As one of the most revered men in the office for his intellect and ability to resolve problems, Steve had people constantly coming to him for advice. He loved the attention and the thanks, but it also stressed him out. Over the years, he began to believe he was the only person in the office who knew what he was doing and that no one was taking the initiative or responsibility to deal with their problems on their own. It was frustrating, and he was sick of it. When Steve would get home, he faced more of the same. His wife and two children were always asking his opinion and wanted to include him in their activities. He never had any time to himself, no matter where he was. He felt barraged by other people's needs, which led to anger and resentment. Wanting to escape all the responsibilities and pressures of the day, he would come home, have a glass of wine, and head to the den to watch TV. Once the wine began to take effect, those upsetting emotional and physical sensations would dissolve and Steve would feel better. Given how well it worked, one drink at night eventually became two and so on. Although drinking wine helped Steve relax, it cost him dearly in his relationships with his wife and children. They complained that he never talked to them and that he was distant and unapproachable. Steve felt conflicted about what he was doing. He loved his family and wanted to connect with them, but he just couldn't tolerate their needs after a long day at work. If only they could be more independent, then maybe he wouldn't have to drink so much. He got to the point where he was drinking a bottle of wine every night and having cravings to drink alcohol during the day. Whenever he had a stressful interaction, the urge to drink was strong. At work, this created huge problems for Steve. He couldn't throw back a shot in the office but he could have a glass of wine at lunch. Drinking this much for several months reinforced the behaviors in his brain. He wound up having cravings for alcohol all the time and found that he would drink even when he wasn't stressed out. What had started as a stress reliever had taken over his life. The urges to drink were present all the time and he could not stop thinking about the next time he could have one. What happened to Steve is essentially what happens in your brain whenever deceptive brain messages strike. Focusing on the deceptive brain messages and trying to make the uncomfortable, distressing sensations go away lead to automatic, unhealthy, habitual responses. How does this happen? Whenever you repeatedly respond the same way to a deceptive brain message by focusing on and engaging in an unhealthy behavior such as drinking alcohol to calm your nerves, you essentially, quote unquote, teach the brain always to respond the same way, i.e. with the same unhealthy behavior. Whenever a similar situation, thought, or impulse arises... Steve felt stressed, took a drink, and felt relief. His brain linked these events together. After Steve had done this enough times, the response became hardwired into his brain and he would start drinking largely without any awareness of what he was doing. In essence, the repetitive behaviors became automatic and unconscious. Steve's mind was no longer involved in determining how he could respond to stress. In addition to teaching his brain to automatically and habitually respond the same way to a deceptive brain message, the attention he focused on these behaviors caused something else to happen. It strengthened the brain circuits associated with drinking wine, which meant that Steve's cravings for wine increased. This is why he began to crave a glass of wine even when he wasn't stressed 
or under the grip of a deceptive brain message. In fact, whenever you repeatedly engage in any behavior, not just those related to deceptive brain messages, the brain circuits supporting it strengthen and the behavior becomes a preferred routine. If it is helpful activity, that's fine. And being aware of what you are doing is not all that important. However, when you engage in a behavior as a result of your deceptive brain message and feel temporary relief, or in this case, an urge that results in momentary pleasure, you are actually working against yourself. We cannot emphasize this point enough. You are making things worse, not better. Not only do these actions waste your time, responding to false brain responding to a false brain message in this way actually amplifies the intensity of the uncomfortable sensations. We call this feeding the monster. We've coined this phrase to highlight how critically important it is to be aware of this process and how it can try to take over your life. What on a biological level feeds the monster? Hebb's law the quantum Zeno effect, and attention density. Let's review each of them now and apply them to Steve's situation. So this is from um, the book, You Are Not Your Brain, by uh, Dr. Jeffrey M. Schwartz, MD, and Rebecca Gladding, MD. And I thought it's interesting because a lot of carryover here into the strength game. So... My focus for this session here, something we've been working on with our students is connection, maintaining connection. You probably see me like putting my hands on my, like on my midsection, right? My thumb around like lower rib and my hand at the, um, let's see if my, um, let me see if my, uh, anatomy is not failing me. The anterior superior iliac spine, big fancy term, what's known as the ASIS, right? It's kind of like the bony top part of your hip. And so, Hebb's Law states, neurons that fire together, wire together. This means that when groups of nerve cells or brain regions are repeatedly activated at the same time, they form a circuit and are essentially locked in together. Okay? And as I was going through this book, it just reminded me, of the three principles of strength that we teach at Strong First. This is actually the lecture that I gave uh, for the press lecture at uh, this past December 2021 SFG1 uh, for the press. And it just reminded me of the three principles of strength that we teach. So number one is irradiation, right? So tensing specific mus- muscle groups, right, to channel into the prime movers, right? So you kind of, if you imagine squeeze, like if you're pressing a single, like a single kettlebell press, and then you squeeze your free hand, that energy, right? That energy flows into the working hand that's pressing the bell, right? You contract your glutes, that that's gonna flow over, right? And then we have feed forward tension, right? This is the, your ability to consciously tense a muscle or a muscle group without the assistance of, a, of an external load. But your focus is to make the lift, right? Tension is just the supporting role. It's not the main event, all right? And so when your focus shifts from like only maximizing tension, you can miss the lift, right? There's a, a saying that your dominanta has changed, Right. Max tension is not the goal. Making the lift is right. This is what we call the professional application of tension. And when you know, when I mentioned when that dominanta changes, that dominanta is the third principle, which it means the, the, the dominant thought. OK, this also you could define this as your focus. Right. And Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz refers to this in the book, You're Not Your Brain, as the quantum Zeno effect. Right. And then Hebb's law states that what fires together, wires together, right? Does this sound familiar? This GTG, right? Grease the groove, right? Paul talked about this in Power to the People. So Hebb's Law essentially is the consistent application of tension, right? This excitation, i.e. this firing of your muscles, creating this 
connection, right? That's kind of like this whole thing that I'm focusing on here is what we've been teaching and working on with our students these last several sessions is maintaining that connection between that top part of the rib, I'm sorry, the lower part of the rib and that, that bony part of your hip known as the ASIS, right? Keeping that, keeping that connected, right? And so that excitation wires new pathways together, okay? And then you got the quantum Zeno effect, i.e. focus, i.e. dominanta, focusing on that said pathway, right? Keeping those muscles firing long enough for them to wire together and fortify a new circuit, right? Read like a permanent connection, a strength connection, okay? Um, to quote Strong first, they said, Dominanta is about making one function far more important than the rest, far more important than the rest, and making other functions its slave, right? So focusing more on, let's say, you know, um, focusing on the muscles that you need to execute the lift, everything else becomes a supporting, like a supporting cast, right? Like I mentioned, the, the focus is making the lift. Focusing on the muscles that need to fire, but focusing on making the lift. And then everything else is the supporting cast. So if you generate full body tension while keeping your focus on the lift, the neural overflow from the unnecessary muscles will make the prime movers contract harder. And this is why strength is a skill because this requires practice. Okay. And so what we've been doing is practicing what, what we, what one of my students is like this, creating this little connection between the, you know, the, the lower ribs and the hip. And she goes, you know, and I told her, I said, uh, just, just imagine you have like a piece of like scotch tape, right? Kind of like holding those two pieces together. And you don't want to break that connection by like hyperextending as you sit back or anything like that. And she goes, it kind of reminds me of a red string. She goes, in my culture, we have this thing, you know, a red string represents like soul connection, right? Uh, she's uh, uh, Indian. And so it's like, it represents soul connection. And I don't know, I just, so we just started calling it the red string tactic. <laughs> so the whole goal here is linkage, not leakage. Right, and I tell you what, our students are feeling more connected. Abs are lit up all day long, according to them. Right, so maintaining that lower rib hip connection. And I'll tell you what, like my deadlifts today are moving a lot faster. I believe this is 180 kilos here for three, and it's just smooth. Like the pull, that's that's the only way I can explain the lifts today. It was just smooth. So as I, if I, as I connected that piece before I, as I sat back into my hips, I maintained that connection and just focused on that wedge and getting through and man, definitely stronger and the barbell was moving faster. It, it felt that way, right? And so what we were, what we've been practicing in these last couple of sessions um, that I started applying here to my deadlift is focusing on that connection, practicing. We have like a few drills that we take them through, like some banded drills, um, some reset drills, and um, focusing on that drill, focusing on the muscles, not the weight, focusing on making the lift, right? And what that does is that sets the quantum Zeno effect into effect <laughs> to keep the muscles firing so they can wire together and create an entirely new brain circuit. All right. And so what happens is, is we kind of, we, we, we practice the drill, right? And then as soon as we're done practicing that drill, we move right to the skill, the pressing, the deadlifting, like whatever it is that we're working, we have our, you know, that we're working on. And that starts to solidify that brain circuit. And then your strength becomes automatic. Look at this little hand. Look at this little dude. This little dude, the kids, I'll tell you what, man, kids are always watching. Like my son, just like every time I go to the gym, he, he wants to come with me. He just sits there and watches me. And when I'm not paying attention, he tries to get on the barbell. Um, but hey, kids are always watching, right? Um, but anywho, this is how your strength becomes automatic. It becomes a habit, just like Steve, right? Steve, he, when he only, only his was an un, obviously like an unhealthy pattern, right? But what happened was, it says when his attention focused on these behaviors, 
it, stre- uh, it strengthened the brain circuit associated with drinking wine, right? So the more that he focused on like his negative, the negative things that were happening at work and the things that were kind of going on at home, the more he focused on those problems, the stronger his desires and his cravings were for the wine, even when he wasn't stressed out. So it already formed a new brain circuit for him. And so we can kind of leverage that for strength training. If we focus on setting up a very specific way every single time, we focus on maintaining connection. What I got here, I got like 207 for a double. Super smooth lift here. Boom. Super smooth lift. This is like my, this is pushing around 90%. Estimated around 90% for me, um, I believe. Where's my fancy calculator? Give me one second. Um, when you can when you can practice setting up like that every single time, hitting that connection, and then once you hit that connection, you you practice the drill, and then you move right to the skill. It wires a whole entirely new brain circuit, and this is how your strength becomes again automatic. All right, so you, let's see what is that two thirties on average. So that's about that was about ninety percent for a double, which is you know moved pretty quick. So. Uh, Weights are moving fast, man. I'm coming. I'm getting ready to come to the end of this first uh, wave of uh, of uh, programming. I've got probably. Let me see here. One, two, three more sessions. Three more sessions, and then I'm going to write an entirely new cycle, and I will have completed 400 over probably over 400 lifts. Um, these last 20. That would well, be what twenty two days. It's a lot of lifts, but I feel freaking great. I feel amazing. I'm still pulling heavy back to back days, so I'm so like so glad that I made that adjustment and pivoted from the way that I was approaching this in the beginning to more of a varied approach, varying the the, the volume, the intensity, hitting those heavy weights on a regular basis, so that way I don't become intimidated by the weights. Um, that was definitely a good call on my part. Um, I think looking back, but um. That's all I want to share with you, man. Focusing on maintaining that strength connection, right? Practicing these drills, practicing on your radiation practice, um, feed for retention, but most importantly, dominanta. What is your focus? Focus on the lift. Don't focus, don't get stressed out and focus on the weights. Focus on the lift, focus on the muscles that need to connect. Once you start connecting those muscles regularly, right, pretensing, and radiation, uh, feed for attention, you practice those things over and over. Like generating tension is one thing. Maintaining the tension, maintaining the strength connection throughout the lift, that's the skill. Okay, that's the skill. Practice the drill, move it to the skill. So, that's what I want to share with you today, man. Day 20, 30 days of deadlifting, and I feel freaking amazing. I'm crushing it. Um, I, as of today, I'm on completing day 21 of 75 hard phase one of the of the Live Hard program. It's a, like a year-long program. And uh, at closing out day 11, I'm down 10 pounds. Dang it, I forgot to check my body fat percentage today. But as of yesterday, I was down about, I think I was down about a whole percentage of body fat and down 10 pounds in the last 11 days. So I've been losing about a pound a day. And I've, I'm losing weight pretty fast because I've got a lot of weight to lose. Uh, my goal is to get to my competition weight for jiu-jitsu, and that's at 190. And as of right now, I'm about 202. This morning, I was 202 this morning. And so uh, just feeling great, man. But uh, that's it. I don't want to keep rambling. I appreciate you watching this series. Um, give this little drill a try. Okay. Use your hands as feedback. Thumb, lower part of the ribs, ring finger, pinky finger, right on that bony part of your hip, the ASIS. Shorten the distance between those two points, which means you're going to have to contract your glutes. Focus on those muscles, that sensation that you feel. Don't break that connection as you hinge back. Focus on setting up like that every single time and soon. It'll become automatic and you'll have a greater strength connection. All right. So that's all I got, man. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow. Peace.